What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Peer Pleasure with Dewey Halpus on Equal Vision Records and Sound Talent Media. I am Dewey, your host with the most, bringing you more great content week after week. This week, guys, we have Shavo Odagian from System of a Down and his new project, North Kingsley. I am so excited to bring you this episode. This was a huge guest, and I have been a fan of System of a Down since the first record. What a fucking month, man. I have Chino from the Deftones, who I've been a fan of since the first record, and then Shavo from System of a Down, who I've been a fan of equally as long as far as first record to now. What an amazing, amazing uh, uh, back catalog these both these guys have, and in the same month. To think, you know, four years ago when I started this show that I'd be having these dudes on this show, you know, fairly easily. Uh, it was something that I would have never imagined, and uh, it's it's really awesome. I'm I'm so stoked you guys get to hear this stuff and and you know be a part of this thing. So thank you so much for coming back week after week. I am super stoked to be doing this episode from the Equal Vision West Coast office in Portland, which has become my studio for the time being. Uh, so this is not being recorded in my car like it usually is, which is uh, something, if you've been listening to the show a long time, I record most of my episodes in the car. And it's nice to have a nice quiet space. I mean, I'm in downtown Portland. The sky is on fire with the wildfire smoke. Uh, you can tell my voice, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is a little scratchy, but it's been days of this shit. And uh, I, I feel for everyone that's lost their home or is having to evacuate, but it's affecting everyone, even down to my kids, you know, scratchy throats and, and, you know, it's, it's something that's affecting everyone, but my heart goes out to those folks that have been displaced right now. And I know a lot of hotels in town are doing their thing to uh, let people stay the night that are displaced. Um, but if you're listening to this and you're in that situation, my heart goes out to you. And, and, uh, I'm really sorry that, that, uh, we're all going through this right now, but uh, let's get some business out of the way real quick uh, before we jump into this episode. So peerpleasurepodcast.com is the website. Peerpleasurepod at gmail.com is my email. If you want to get in touch with me uh, or anyone on the team, you can hit up that email um, or you can hit up the website. The press contacts are on there. Um, we have Big Picture Media on board doing press for the show now. Um, and the, like I said, the Equal Vision and Sound Talent families have been unreal and many thanks to them. Uh, we have merch up in uh, the merch store on the on the website. We've got long sleeve. Winter is here. Winter is coming. Fall is here. Pumpkin spice everything, except this fucking shirt. There's no pumpkin spice anywhere near this shirt. It's uh, long sleeve. Peer pleasure down the sleeve. It's got the new branding on the back. It's got a new logo on the front. This thing is badass. It's printed on comfort colors. Head on over and support the show and pick up one of those shirts. Um, yeah, I'm going to plug this on every episode because these things are badass. And once we have them, they're being printed this month. Once we have them, we'll get some pictures up so you guys can see uh, how badass you could look if you went and got one of these shirts. So hit up Peer Pleasure Pod, uh, peerpleasurepodcast.com, hit the merchandise link, and uh, yeah, let's do this thing. All right, so I want you guys to also tell a friend, uh, tell a family member about the show. Uh, shoot me some feedback. I've got some amazing feedback from the Brian McTurnan episode that was a damn difficult episode to do just because it was so personal, uh, you know, and I, I hate breaking down on this show, uh, but it happened. And it's something that, uh, you know, this, this show is my therapy, as you guys know. I keep it as real as possible. I edit as little as possible, basically just cutting off the phone ringing at the beginning. Um, so everything goes into the stew. And, you know, hopefully it's something that, that you guys all enjoy and will continue to enjoy for a long time. Because I think about, you know, people ask me why I don't edit the show, and it's simple. If you were sitting on an airplane, say say you were sitting on an airplane, and someone uh, super interesting came down, sat next to you, and you had a conversation on that flight. Say you had a two-and-a-half-hour conversation, right? How much of that did you edit Right? Did you edit it? You can't. You can't cut out the ums and ahs. You can't cut out the background noise. You can't cut out uh, the experience of having a fucking conversation with somebody. So, I mean, what you have to do is put it out there just as real as you can. Punk rock, DIY, just do it your way, right? And that's what we're doing. So, hopefully, that answers that question. And I, I know you guys on board for a long time are on board with it. Uh, but I'm going to continue to do it that way. 
Of course, we got some nicer gear. Hopefully my voice sounds better uh, not doing this in the car, but at the same time, it's still gonna be the same. It's gonna be raw, it's gonna be real, it's gonna be there in your face. So uh, thank you guys so much for coming back week after week. This intro is getting long. So without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Shavo Adagian from System of a Down and now North Kingsley. Saying, swear these kids don't even know what to look for. They just throw away their votes and then post more. I got a sticker and I'm woke and I stood for all the issues that I'm told that I should for. Do it for the gram, die for the pick, right? Roll up on the land, die to evict ice. Any real man flies on the big stripe. You could throw hands, I'ma throw a pen knife. Call me Go Hand, saying super lines like Super Saiyan on that Kamehameha light. Bumping 88, going back in time, right? Coming Klein on the 55 prom night. I was an illusion, time is a construct. If it ain't like bad and bougie, ain't nobody gon' buy none. It was 2019, you were yelling and dying. You know, one decision mattered, it was public opinion. me their platform to do one but then it was right before the pandemic oh shit so plus like a lot started happening with the new group and then with the brand 22 red and then it's just i have three kids so it kind of got a little in the way i was like you know what let me pause this idea i can't i don't want to put too much on my plate you know what i mean if you put too much you spread yourself so thin that you can't really succeed in any of it so i kind of follow that mentality where it's like let me do as much as i'm good to do you know so everything comes out 100 percent instead of 70 70 70 then i'm kind of like you know it's like not good sure sure you have so you have three you have three kids i have three kids as well um you do how old and how uh what 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 sex is what 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 thing are the boys girls oh yeah so i've got uh, i've got a few of each so <laughs> i've got uh my my stepdaughter is 20 she is uh uh in college and then i've got um my son Grayson is almost nine. He'll be nine the, the second of September, and then my daughter Cora is uh, seven. So, dude, my boy turns nine September eighth, and dude. then my other boy turns seven September thirtieth. Good lord! So, yeah, we're similar in that. I don't have the twenty year old, but I do have a girl <laughs> that's two years old. So, <laughs> dude. minus the zero, yeah, we're the same. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, That's awesome. crazy. Such an yeah, interesting brother. age, man. And so oh. that that brings me to my first thought here is is do you teach your could you put your kids into everything? Uh like everything they want to do or do you kind of uh kind of pick up on what they're good at? I mean and it's still kind well, of early in the game for this, but uh Yeah. That's a great question. Approach? That's a great question, bro. Um well, I try to open doors for them. You know what I mean? And like lay things in front of them. There's this old custom and Ar I don't know if it's an Armenian thing or, but it's a custom where when the kid has their first tooth, they have this thing where they um, lay out, they have like a little party and, and they lay out like a bunch of stuff, like a guitar, a, a, a doctor's thing and a pen, a pad. And you know what I mean? Just a bunch of stuff, chef stuff. And then the first thing the kid reaches for is what they're going to do. It's like kind of an old wife's tale thing. That's what they're going to become. You know what I mean? Yeah. Both my kids reached out for the guitar, you know what I mean? And I was like, ah, you know, I don't know if I want them to be exactly. But of course, before even they, I had kids, I always purchased, like I bought things for kids. I knew I love kids, right? My whole life I've loved, adored kids. And I knew one day I was going to have kids and I was going to be a dad. And I was really ready for it a while back. So when I went shopping, for example, like in Japan 20 years ago, I bought a bunch of toys. Just, and I put them away. I stopped and giving them those toys. They have like collectible shit, like Transformers and Japanese writing boxes and shit, cool shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I bought parts for the miniature guitars. You know, like I have these Gibson Flying V's and Les Pauls miniature. I, I just, you know, 
and I'm giving it to them one by one. But having to answer your question, I kind of let them do what they want, but then I realize what they're good at. Cause you know, like my boys, seven, seven and nine, right? One's turning seven in September, one's turning nine in September, two years, two years and 22 days apart, 22. It's crazy. Two has been a part of my life for a long time. So I pretty much, they're so good at different things. Like one guy's like 40, six year old, seven year old's riding a bike already. Nine year old's not, but he's doing like crazy math and he's on the computer and he's like his first in his class and he reads, he reads books. Like he's like, pick, he loves, he like spends time and finds a book and like finishes it and then tells me about it, like a report. The other one, hell no. The other one's like playing and doing crazy shit, like jumping <laughs> off of like couches and stuff. So. But I give them both what they, what I think they can do. You know, I put them both in basketball. I put them both in running. I put them both in, they both have guitar lessons. And then they both have Taekwondo. Uh, they're both about to become black belts in Taekwondo because it started them off at four, four years old, four oh or six, six. Yeah, both are on that Bo Don level, whereas like next level is black belt, you know? So um, I just kind of let them do what they do. And then I let, I also give them the advice of like, you know, do what you're good at because that's, how you're going to succeed do what's fun and what you're already good at because it's like that's just an advice i've gotten when i was a kid you know because uh, if you're already good at something it, it comes naturally if yeah. you practice that you're gonna be the best at it you know what i mean if you just practice because a lot of people have to practice to get to where you are naturally so if you're good at something naturally like you're physically good at something or you're mentally good at something you should follow that and like become the best at that then you stand out because it's one fun to do Two, it's easier. It comes easier to you, so it's not so much of a hassle. And three, it just becomes a natural thing after a while, you know. Yeah. So that's the advice I give them. And I kind of, at first, I open the door for them to try whatever they want, whatever they're interested in. I don't force nothing upon them. But the Taekwondo was kind of like they didn't know what was going on. Took them to the classes because I felt like they both. Who knows, man? I've we've both grown up, bro. We've been in sixth grade. You know how it is, Hell you know. Yeah. And you know, anything you got to pick on, anything. You can say something the wrong way and for the rest of your life, you're known for what you said. You can, you can, you can, I don't know, fall one day and that's it. In front of everybody, that's it, you fell, that's it. Oh, you're the guy that fell. So there's so many things that you could get picked on. So yeah, bro, I gave them Taekwondo. They both started off a little, like they couldn't even do, like th their splits were like halfway off the ground. And then now they're like touching the ground, they're sparring. Well, with the pandemic, they had to stop going to classes. So they got Zoom Taekwondo classes. So I don't know how that that's going to be. You know what I mean? Uh, but I'm Lord. just I'm just letting them go through the motions so they don't forget it. I can always pull them out. But I was like, if I pull them out now at Bodon level, which is like the level right before black, they're going to forget about it. And they're not going to want to do it anymore. They're going to have more interest. You know what I mean? Other things come up. So I kind of want them to finish what they started. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then maybe take them to a different martial arts afterwards. It's always good to have that self-defense thing inside of you, you know? Sure. Uh, sure. It's important. It's, I wish my parents did that for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you picked up martial arts as an adult? No. Or not no, at all? No, I haven't. Not at all. Not at all. I wish I did. But it's just kind of like I got too much, like I said, on my plate to yeah. get that also now. Maybe one day, but I feel like I'm getting old. What I did pick up later in age was working out, going to the gym and like feeling good. You know, like yeah, I had never worked out in my life. I always used to hate that. I'd work out for one, two days. I'd be like, eh, I'm done with this. You know, I have better things to do. Uh huh. And I, I always used to say, how come my habits are – because I used to have some bad habits, like, you know, liking different things that are not good for you, you know? Yeah. I used to drink, do all sorts of fun stuff, crazy stuff. So I was like, I want to have a habit of like something like people wouldn't – I want to be like the ones that go to the gym and like they need to go and they love to go. One day it happened, bro. It just happened. I just I, – you know, I had an epiphany going, dude, I got to eat healthy. I was 41, 42 – I'm 46 now. So 41, 42 and I was like 220 pounds, never that much in my whole life. I've always been in the 160s, 170. So I was like, bro, I got to do something about this. So I, um, I started – I went to the gym, I got a trainer, and I just kind of went on a mission, bro. And I lost 50 pounds in like six, seven months. And I still work out and I still eat good now. I'm not no buff guy or nothing. I'm still skinny, <laughs> but at least I'm skinny and not fat like I was. For When I say fat, I don't mean fat. I mean just out of shape, you yeah. know, unhealthy. Yeah. I like – you feel so much better once you get into this other – once your body weight matches your personal like skeleton weight, where it's like, it's easy for your skeleton to handle, life becomes so much better, you know? Imagine, I, I now do squats with 50 pounds in my hand. Imagine, that's like a self body weight squat before. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. How yeah. tough it is to go up and downstairs. I used to get tired. I used to get out of breath going upstairs. 
and I'll go out. Now it's like I do that for like cardio. Sometimes if I can't go to the gym, I'll run up and down the stairs like 12 times and that'll be my cardio and it works, you know? Yeah. So it's just, you know, to each his own. And I love the way it makes you feel. So I could have gotten into martial arts, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to be help, become healthy again, you know? So I think it's good enough. Yeah. So, no, <laughs> I know? agree. Dude, I yeah. – Speaking of sixth grade, so I, I, I got glasses in sixth grade, and that's when everything got okay. fucked up because oh, no. <laughs> then I got so much shit for, uh, oh, my God. That's when, yeah, things change. But when did you when did you come over uh, from Armenia? How old were you? I was five. Five. I was five. Okay, so old. way earlier. Yeah. Way earlier. I was five. It was in 79. Um, and it was, I guess my parents wanted to move earlier, like 73. Uh huh. But I, my mom got pregnant with me, so um, they they chilled. They they stayed another five years, just until I was able to travel. You know. Okay. And yeah, uh, it's crazy because my whole like family uprooted and came. It wasn't just like family meaning four of us or three of us. It was like uncles, aunts, cousins, grandparents, like everyone. Kind of like they've had it at the time. It was the USSR. It was. It was a Soviet Republic, you know, we're a country, bro, but we were taken over by the USSR and it wasn't a, it wasn't such a bad thing. It was like that they at least protected us from like neighboring crazy countries like Turkey and Azerbaijan and stuff like that. So, yeah. I mean, it is what it is, you know, but when I came here, it was like, wow, you can play music and like have a living from that. You know what I mean? Make a living out of it. Wow. You know? Yeah. So it all started then, you know, <laughs> the whole, like, let me do something crazy. You know, I always wanted to do different things. My whole, I've always been that kid, you know? Yeah. That, um, when did you find that it. spirit, man? Like you do so many things. It's, it's it, just like, I mean, just looking through, you know, a lot of the things you've been working on, like, I mean, are you, where do you just have that creative mind? Like, uh, that, that drive, like what instilled that in you? I don't know, man. Maybe seeing my dad and what my mom. What did you do? What did your dad do work, for a living? They work, bro. They were like, they just had, they, I mean, when they came to America, you know, they left everything, bro. They left everything behind and um, God, came to give imagine me, that. You imagine having like a dollar in your pocket and like, and they even like, you know, like the border uh, in, in Russia, they took all our belongings. You know, they took Holy that's what, this is the story. Like they took the wedding rings, they took like their jewelry, they took things that they shouldn't be taking. They they, they allowed nothing to go through. So they were like they came here in like nothing, you know? So the fact that they both had two jobs, just seeing that, you know, seeing how hard they're working. Hold on one second, bro. My little girl is like okay. banging at my office door. <laughs> no problem. Let me let me uh let me see. She's just taking away my uh, my 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 train of thought because I'm hearing her go papa papa oh. and knocking on my door. <laughs> I understand. I my, yeah, you know what it is. So, anyways, um, so just seeing them work so hard to put bread on the table and to give me a roof over my head. We lived in a little apartment, um, one bedroom apartment up on North Kingsley Drive <laughs> in Hollywood. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, that's how the name started yeah. came from the new. But that, it's just seeing them work so hard and seeing my dad, it's like he would work two jobs and then he would come home and he would be like, uh, he would be the man of the house and he would do so much for us. Like he would still be present for me. I was an only child till I was 11 years old also. So I see how much he worked and did, but still like went at it for me, you know, yeah. and uh, for the, my mom took care of us and was there when I needed him. And it just and whenever there was something needed to be done around the house, I'd see how he would jump into action. You know, what I mean, I, um, you know, he would like fix things. He would do things. It was like we didn't have any money to hire people to do things, so he would do it. Like if there was something wrong with the plumbing, I'd see him get on his knees and fix the plumbing. I would see him like fix the wall, fix the door, fix the window, whatever outside, whatever it took. You know, he whatever it took, he had to do because he was the man of the house. You know. Yeah. And and then seeing my mom, how hard she worked to put bread on the table too. Like you know, she. She, uh, she had two jobs where she was like an office manager at like, well, she started off like not as a manager, but she got to become a manager at some supermarket working up in, the, up in the office upstairs. And then, I don't know, she had a couple of other things she was doing. And for them to leave their education back there, you know, my mom is a link, she was a, she was a, a, a language major, so communication. So she had, she knew like seven languages, you know, in Armenia. And she came here knowing English, teaching me that from birth, knowing we're gonna move one day. Um, 
my dad, he, he was, he was at, at 23, he was teaching kids. He was a, he, he was a teacher there and he was a tailor and he came back and he came here. And I remember he, whatever, he, none of that worked here. You know what I mean? That's a, you can't say, Oh, I was a tailor in Armenia and me become, or hey, I, I had a college. At, they're like, but what college they're, you know, in America, Armenian colleges don't really pass, you know what I mean? For having the credentials. So they had to start from scratch, bro. Imagine working hard, going to college, going to school, this, this, and you come here and then none of that is valid. That's crazy, you know? That's insane. So, yeah, and all that maybe probably instilled that in me because I started working at 14. My dad took me to his friend's shop. His friend was an electronics guy and he would like, it was a place, I don't even know how to explain it. It was a place in Hollywood that went through decks, like set decks, uh, stereo components of like, let's say Porsche or like Ford. They would go through like 300 of the same decks, make sure every function works. And then if something didn't work, they would fix it and then call it refurbished, put it in a box. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So I just, cause at 14, you can't legally work. So I would go and I'd watch. It was like, my dad said, at least learn some trades, you know, while you can't work. So. All my summers went there where I would go and learn how to do that. So I kind of like he I guess my dad instilled my my, my parents instilled that work workaholic energy in me. And it, I always worked, always worked, even when I was in the system of a down, like I would manage the band. So my day consisted of this when we started. I would wake up at 5 a.m. I was working at a bank in L.A. or called a first interstate back in the day. It was a, I was working at the downtown office. So I would wake up at five. I'm in system of a down. This is happening. I'd wake up at five, be at work at six, because you got to. I was doing wire transfer, so you got to be with the East Coast time. So at six, it's nine there. Mm -hmm. I'd be at work at six in downtown. I'd work till three p.m. or two p.m., and then I would go to school from five to seven, and then from eight to ten, I would rehearse with system, and then I would go home sleep, and the next day would be the same exact thing. And at work, when I was doing wire transfers, because I was on the phone. After every wire transfer, I would make a call to like the Roxy or the Whiskey or somewhere to get me a gig, to get us a gig, because I was also managing system at the time. So it was like, after every phone call, I was like, hey, Roxy, can I help you? Yeah, it's Shavo from System Who? Like, we need a show. You need a demo tape. We don't have a demo tape. Click. Ah, oh, fuck. You know, <laughs> next call. Hey, thanks for calling uh, First Interstate. How can I help? You know what I mean? It was like one to the brain. It split into two pieces. So, um, yeah, bro. That's always been my thing, you know? And then when system recently, not recently, but lately hasn't been working a lot, you know, we have some shows and no album, no new music, and we're not getting together. So I was like, I was getting artistically starving. I was like, I had so much in me that wasn't coming out, you know? Yeah. And especially since I lost the weight and I did that. And prior to that, you know, I was so much to talk about, bro. There's so many other things I was doing that I kind of quit a, a bunch of bad things. And it gave me this like, it gave me like this whole new self living style. Like, come on, you got to go get it now, you know, go get it. It was a yeah. go getter vibe. You know? Yeah. So I started a new band and I started a new company and they're both kind of thriving right now. And it's, well, the band just started. So it's, I love the reactions I'm getting from, from North Kingsley. And then I have the 22 red brand, which is the lifestyle cannabis brand that mm -hmm. is two years old now. And that's thriving, doing really well, knock on wood. Yeah. Uh, so it is what it is, bro. You know, it's that's what it made it like kind of doing. I've, I've come from an Im I'm an immigrant family, so it takes hard work to, to get to succeed. That's where the whole mentality. So to answer your original question, I think it's because of the way I was brought up and the, my circumstances. You know, there was no other way to do it. There was I was never spoon fed. I was never didn't wake up. wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Uh, that's for sure. So. Oh, no. You know, it just, I saw hard work gets you somewhere. So I worked hard, you know? Well, that's, see, that's, that's amazing. And that's, and, but this ties into some other things too, uh, Shavo, because like uh, a lot of people I talk to on this show, you know, come from, you know, households where a parent or, or both parents were either not there or unattentive or, you know, they basically had to raise themselves, right? So they had to grow up earlier than normal, right? And, yes. but in your situation, it's kind of similar because it's, and this is just me from the outside looking in, but uh, with your parents being so attentive, but so focused on, you know, giving you the tools to succeed and, and 
where did you find time in your early years to be a kid? Like, you know, at 14, you're going and learning, you know, your summers learning with your dad. Like, did you skateboard? Did you have like, uh, yes. you know, friends and like, uh, or were you always like hustling and working with your folks? No, I wasn't always hustling. And okay. Working. I totally had a bunch of friends. I was a skater in Hollywood. Like a bunch of my friends that were skaters became professional skaters uh, for Pal Peralta and company. So I have okay, friends like Bones that. Bones Brigade and shit. Pa Bones Brigade. Paulo Diaz was a neighbor of mine. Um, uh, Gabriel Rodriguez, Guy Mariano, those guys were skating all around me. I was with them in some of the videos. You could see me in the background. Like if you blink, you miss, but I'm there. <laughs> um, I learned tricks from motherfuckers like Nottis who lived in Santa Monica. I kind of wasn't his friend or nothing. I was a fan. I had his board. I don't know how I found out where he lived. I kind of did some like, I looked at pictures. I found out the street name. I went. It's a funny story. When I was 14, I um, I was really deep into skateboarding. It was like I had that mentality where I was like, hey, man, what would I be doing if I didn't have this board? You know what I mean? Like if I didn't skate and I didn't want to do the next best trick, what would I be doing with myself? Like I, I was playing guitar, but it still wasn't – guitar wasn't above skating just yet, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It was like, so I, my heroes were Rodney Mullen, Nottis, you know, uh, uh, Tommy Guerrero, uh, Steve Caballero, you know, those guys were like, yes. like just shit, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I would, um, Jeff Hartzell, that guy would skate up in Venice. So I would go to Venice and skate over there and I would see these guys. My, my fucking heroes were skateboarding around me. So I would watch them and learn from them, you know, cause it's another thing that my parents taught me was, you know, you can learn a lot from watching just like they put me in that electronic store. And I, I watched, I wasn't doing, I was watching and I learned. So, um, which made me tech savvy later on in life. I mean, go figure, you know what I mean? That 14 year old moment made me tech savvy when I got older. Cause I watched, you know, trial and error, you know, what you got to do to see what's wrong and you can fix problems. It's a good way to, I mean, I, fucking bless my parents for doing that at the time i wasn't thinking that i was like fuck this <laughs> but uh but now i'm like fuck hell yeah dude thank you for doing that for caring so much and having such a such a mission to put put me in the right state of mind so yeah bro i would skate um i would skate the streets of la bro i would make i have skating videos from then bro one day i'm gonna bust that on people um I have like yes. my 14 year old self skateboarding, doing tricks. You know, I used to do the whole, so my dad had this old VHS recorder, like from the first like era, like the generation one, you know, in the eighties. And you would have to put it on your shoulder. You put the big ass VHS in there and it would just be like film, take the VHS, put it in your, sorry, take the, the cassette, put it in your VHS player and VCR. And there it is. Right. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I kind of figured out how to uh, edit I didn't know how that happened either at that age, but um, I guess we had these RCA cables and my grandma had a VHS, of course, a, a VCR up, and she lived above us in an apartment above us on, third, on, uh, on North Kingsley. And, and I, when they were all gone, my dad wasn't around during the day, of course, I would find time, I would go grab her v a VCR, bring it down to ours, connect it with the, v uh, the RCAs, yep. put the tape, put a blank tape and like record press record and play, press play on one, record, and then put the scenes that I'm not falling down, you know, to make it like a nice edit of like a moment. <laughs> yes. that where I landed the trick. You know what I mean? Shit you do not <laughs> easily on your phone. Yeah. Shit you do on your phone. I'm trying to do it two VCRs back then, you know? <laughs> fucking Dude, crazy. I remember, and I did man. It. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. And I did that shit, bro, and I recorded, and I still have those videos. We, we name them Speed Boys and all these crazy names, each one. I had a friend, Rafi. He's still around. I hope he hears this. Um, him and I used to skate everywhere together, bro. And we had, fan, you know, we were fans of Nottis, like I said. I have the story of Nottis, so I was 14. I found out with the street he lived on, and I knew roundabouts. I don't know how. There was no internet. There's nothing like that, right? And uh, uh, my parents would go to the beach weekly, and I had them drop me out there once. And I was just chilling outside on the street that I knew he lived somewhere on the street. And the house I stood up in front of, some old lady came out. And she goes, are you a friend of Nottis? And I'm like... Mm, not really, but I'm a fan. So, oh my God, come inside. It was Nottis' mom, dude. Nottis' mom, I swear to God, takes <laughs> me inside. Swear to God, dude, takes me inside, shows me Nottis' old room, gives me a bunch of pictures and stickers and shit like that. And and sure enough, Nottis rolls through like with his friends and shit, like Jason, uh, Stra Julian Stranger and all these mo they rolled up and they're like, who the fuck is this kid in our house? <laughs> and here I am, a 14-year-old kid with like, 
salivating going, Oh my God, these are the guys, you know? And so, you know, sure enough, outside he made me do a couple of tricks and then he showed me a couple of things i don't think he'll even remember but it was crazy you know at that time that was huge for me bro like i, I was a go-getter i found my hero and i had it and i went somehow ended up in his house <laughs> somehow <laughs> got got recognized by his mom and like you know what i mean so it's cool stories bro cool shit happened you know these are things that made me you know yeah. who i am dude you, you know? probably had some pretty fucking i mean you've already so, said some of them but some pretty profound things happened to you on that street, you know, uh, yeah. and going from Armenia to, did you go straight to Los Angeles? Because growing up in Hollywood, I would assume is just, uh, bonkers, you know, because you see so, I mean, yeah. so many transplants and so many people oh, are just bro. there for one thing, not necessarily to yeah. live, but to make something either they do or they don't and they fail or they win. And then they're gone, right? Like it's it's yeah. it's like a uh, a weird. It's like Vegas or something. Like it's something that <laughs> to somebody else is like a dream, but to people who live there are just kind of like, all reality. right, how long is this person going to be here? You know, like it's reality, yeah. Um, so we moved. We weren't in LA. The, okay, so from Armenia, we had to move to um, Italy to become citizens there. I don't know what exactly the reason was but we couldn't the borders of america were closed you know they think oh, it's bad shit. now okay. yeah they were closed so they wouldn't allow anyone from the u.s to start to like come to america right so we had to go elsewhere and then come from there we moved to queens i was a new yorker for a few months and um then my dad's side moved to la to the west coast my mom's side stayed and i stayed with my mom for a couple of months more but then my mom tells me that she didn't want me not to have a dad, so she moved back, and then we moved to L.A., and then when I moved to L.A., and then my mom's side moved soon enough, sh you know, shortly came and moved to the West Coast also. So, and then that's where I ended up on North Kingsley Drive. But I could have ended up a New Yorker in Queens, and my life would have been totally different. Yeah, you, know? you still would have been a musician, but, though. Yeah, you know, I'm sure I would, because it was always in me, man. But I don't know. Who knows? I've always liked things. I've always had passion for things, and, you know... I'm like one of those people that agrees like it's passion, consistency, and hard work gets you anything you want in life, you know? Yeah, exactly. Do you, do you know uh, Rob Blasco? Of course. He oh, was, dude. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know him very well. He's I know a, him very well. He's a buddy of mine too, and, and he's one of those Hollywood guys, like grew up in L.A., yeah, he's and well, he's either going to do or he's not. Yeah, when we started playing uh, the scene prior to being signed and all that stuff, he's one of the first people I met. He was in a band called Suffer. Okay. And uh, and that's how we met. And it wasn't Blasco, it was Rob. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he became Blasco afterwards. But yeah, man, he's one of the first cats I met. Dude, know? I love that guy. And he uh he's, he's just he just reminds me of of like the Hollywood that like grew up great born and raised in Hollywood, like gonna make it like no no plan B, just fucking go for it. And didn't yep. end up working at Guitar Center, right? Like he fucking yeah. did it too. It's it's fucking <laughs> that's what awesome. happens to most people. That's what happens to most people. <laughs> Guitar Center is where they end up, you know? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Man. So that's crazy, bro. You know, Rob, that's great, man. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I haven't seen him for a little bit. I, last time I saw Rob, well, maybe I saw him early after that, but I saw Rob at a, the comedy store at a friend's, a mutual friend's gig. Um, um, fuck. Craig Gass at Craig Gass's okay. show. Yeah, Craig that's is hilarious. Like, yeah, he is. He's, you know, Craig Gass was at my wedding. Craig Gass gave, oh, a, yeah. gave a speech on my wedding as, because, you know, he does impressions. So he he did a speech um, as, like, Christopher Walken and Gene Simmons and shit, like, giving me a a, a, a wedding <laughs> <laughs> speech. Like, he was like, yeah, these guys weren't, uh, they wanted to be here, but they couldn't because they were filming a movie. So uh, they told me to, you know, represent. So he, like, gave a, <laughs> these, I still have that on video. It's hilarious, bro. Dude. But you know what? It was an Armenian wedding. I was like, my wedding was so crazy. Um, it was like my, I had people like the Riza, John Fushante, Craig Gass, my grandma, my aunt. <laughs> like, all these, like old, <laughs> it was just like, it was just, so all the like the older Armenians weren't getting it when he was doing like um, a Tracy Morgan, like no one knew who the fuck that was. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Except a few of us that were, that were dying, you know, because he was doing it, you know, it was so great. So. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Dude, I think we have a lot of mutual friends. I, it's just funny that System stopped touring very much, you know, after I started. I was a true musician, too, about 12 years. Yes. And, and uh, uh, at that point, like, System wasn't active. So I don't I, – we probably never crossed paths except the times I saw System. Uh, I think you came you, – you joined, I think I, – I, I know a little history of you. I think you joined 
the group in 06 or something like that. That's yeah. exactly when we stopped. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, but- dude, yeah, I, I remember seeing. So I remember seeing you guys and Deftones at a rock fest in Portland, in like Columbia Meadows or something. Oh, Portland man. Meadows, some long time ago. Like we first moved down. We're like, holy shit, System and Deftones on the same show. And now, like, I'm on the phone with you now, like, doing this with the oh, yeah. show. Like, Chino uh, lives here in Portland, hit me up as a fan of the show, wanted to come on. So now, oh, we've wow. been, it's it's crazy. Like, I I love Chino, dude. He's I the love best. The Deftones guys are my favorite, bro. Those guys, dude. I mean, I got a few favorite bands that I really like get along with, and I think they're like really cool. But the Deftones guys, we share a lot, bro. Uh, when they were. They okay. Here's a quick little story, dude. I love so these stories. They, yeah, yeah. So they rented a house in Malibu to to do a album, a recorded an album. It was the same house that Incubus did on Morning View. Morning the View, album Morning yes. View. Yes. So they rented out Morning View, right? This is a crazy story. And I lived in Calabasas, which is like 15 minutes from the place. So uh-huh. I would like, and I was single, so it was like Deftones are 15 minutes away partying let's go right <laughs> so the, <laughs> the, every night i would if not like i would like leave in the morning come back at night you know we would we had the best time together but i don't know if they even made a they recorded one song because we just had so much fun we you know it was just a party you know yeah um so fast forward when I, okay but when i was there like one of the nights i was like this is a great place to have a wedding i don't know why i thought that because it was like on the cliff overlooking the ocean i was like this is beautiful right well, 2010 rolls around. I got married there, bro. Whoa. I, I got married at Morning View, bro. I rented out the place and I threw a wedding. Yeah, I was like, this, <laughs> I made that, I made it a reality, bro. That's one of the things I like doing. It's like, shit, have a wish, make it a goal. Yes. Accomplish it, bro. Boom. Next. What's the next goal? That I, what's, what's the next? The next? <laughs> yeah, bro. I, I mean, love that. Just you know I mean? that's, toss that's how you it do, keep bro. rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it wrong. You don't stop there. You succeed. So that should sh- that should tell you, hey man, this shit's possible. Let's see where we could take this whole wishing and making reality. You know, yeah. Um, that was one of the shit that like was like things that I, like really secured that belief in me that you can make anything happen. You sure. Know? Well, seeing all your stuff get taken away at the border and then like having to rebuild and nothing, nothing you've accomplished. Uh, you know, where you're at matters here. Like the, having that, having that experience, even at five, like shit, yeah, man, bro. like that is, that'll burn trauma. in your brain. Trauma, bro. Trauma. Exactly. I, you know, uh, I've been told that, like, I think I said this some other place, but I think a move like that at that age is almost as traumatic as a death. I think that's somewhere in the psychology book. Some, some therapist told me that, um, that it's just as deep and it, it digs just as deep because you're being uprooted. Yeah. So like reality, it's a reality change. Like imagine I'm born in a country, one people, one type of people, one race, one language, one everything, right? Yeah. Now I'm moving to a country that's a melting pot of people, melting pot of languages, just just like crazy different thing you know just like its own beast and it's like a reincarnation like in in live time like it's 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 crazy i i can't even imagine or even begin to imagine yeah thank god i only went positive you know for a minute and not because a lot of people could take that and like oh i'm a fuck you know i don't know i was doomed to begin with you know like no i was you know, I'm, I'll take the positive approach. I've always been an optimist, bro. Even when the darkest days come, I always look at the positive, like the, the little crack of sun that might be coming in. I'm like, okay, I'm going to follow that little light and see where it takes me. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One thing, I, one thing I noticed too, it, this is something <clears throat> might be a little weird, I guess, but something I always noticed about you live. Um, and I don't know if this is what I think it is, but uh, you have this on stage persona, right? And, but you're always like making eye contact with oh, the yeah. crowd it, yeah, yeah is that that's intentional old- because that is like uh, uh it's I- intentional bro it's in, it what it's it's both now it's just a habit and it works but it when i was 14 my dad took me to a kiss concert and i've said this before i was 14 my, ta- my dad took me to a kiss concert. somehow i i don't know i've been lucky too you know like the building in hollywood on north kingsley that i lived on was owned by this person that was a or oh, the investor or something she was a hairdresser and she did 
famous people's hair. And so one day when my mom was talking to her daughter about rent or something, we found out she does Gene Simmons' hair. Now, I was a Kiss fan because I'm a kid, you know, six, seven, eight years old. You're a Kiss fan. You yeah. see Kiss, you're a Kiss fan. How could you not be? You're seeing makeup, fire, blood, let's go, right? So, and I wasn't even listening to the, I mean, I listened to the music, but I, was, I didn't even know, like, older music. I knew what was happening back then, and it was just like, it shaped me. So it turns out that that's who she was. She's like, if your son's a fan, we get tickets all the time. The next concert they do, we'll get you a ticket. So they got us tickets. Me and my dad went. We were like seventh row. So, and at some point, I thought Gene Simmons looked at me and like waved or looked or smiled. Of course, he was just looking in my area, right? I was yeah. not. But that's what I took from it. It was memory. And I'm 46 and I'm telling you that story, right? I'm like, fuck yeah. that. Made me so... At some point playing live, I was like, dude, I just looked at that kid. That kid smiled back. I smiled. It was a moment I had. It was like this. It's such energy transfer back and forth. You've been on stage. You know what it's Hell like. Yeah. So I was like, why not give that one experience I got at 14 to a bunch of kids every night? That would be so rad because I'm all about giving. Dude, I don't know, man. There's a lot of negative people out there. I try to keep it positive and try to help people. I'd like to be a good memory for everyone. I want to, you know, if I'm up there and I'm. It's performing, we're entertaining, and I want to entertain not for myself. Yeah, I play for myself, but when you're on stage, you're playing for your audience too. So it was something in me. It was like I love that, you know. So I caught eye contact. I remember the first time I was like, "Oh yeah," and we kept eye locked. And I was <laughs> playing my part, and I noticed this kid's like having that moment, you know. And I'm like, "Fuck!" And I looked away, and I went to someone else, and that kid's now having that moment, and then that girl is having that moment, and that dude's having that moment. And it was like, I was like, oh, I have such control right now of people's emotions, right? Yeah. So why not use it for a good, you know, and like make them happy and make them come go home with a story and have that, who knows? I'm sure there's people telling that story. Man, I was a watch system over down. The bass player looked at me, smiled. I winked and he winked back. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, right. That's cool. Fuck so I yeah, just, dude. Yeah. So I always, that became part of my stage presence, man. It's like, being in my own world, but still being able to step away for a second just to capture a fan and have a moment and go back into my zone because there is that zone, bro. We walk out there and, you know, the energy, the yell of the crowd, the scream makes you go red. I see red. I'm like, Oof. I don't know what color, but I see a different color and I'm like, let's go. I become a different beast out there Dude. than the guy you're talking to, you know, and why not share that moment with others? It's the one. It's wonderful. Dude, do you associate that? That's fantastic. That's one of the coolest things. I've ever heard, right? Like that's like that's <laughs> and, and and to do that, like yes, you know, you're giving them that experience, which you have the power at that point. But you're not mm -hmm. doing it because you have the power. You're doing it out of out of giving, right? Yes. It's not you yes. being I'm a fucking rock star and you're loving this. No. It's it's that's what's cool about it is it's so genuine and pure. Like I'm going, oh, yeah. I can have the opportunity now to give this person something that they didn't have before. Uh -huh. And I'm going to do that you know, the entire yeah, fucking set. Yes, yes. And I still do it. And I look forward to getting up there again when I can. Dude. Because that's part of the show. That's part of the love. That's part of the vibe, you know? Yes, exactly. It is. And it's something we've been so lucky to be able to do that maybe that mm -hmm. kid will never get the chance. Maybe that's not their dream. Maybe it is. And they'll never have that chance. But they had that moment. And that's, that solidifies that, you know, if you look on, like, I I forget the last time I looked at, at System on, like, Facebook or something, there's, like, 18 million followers, right? How many <laughs> yeah. of those are still there after this time because that was the kid you looked at? You know, think of how many shows you've done. No. Fuck, dude. That's yeah. got to be astronomical. A lot. A bunch. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, I agree. Dude. Well, this this brings me to so I've I've got another thing I want to talk about here because you said you you were seeing seeing color seeing red. Do you associate things with color? Do you have like a oh, a lot of people do that like uh, different things or different there's, colors in their head? There's a name for it, uh, synesthesia. I didn't know until recently. Um, but like the alphabet, every letter has a number. Uh, I mean, sorry, a color. Yeah, uh, and number, a number one through ten. Every number has a color in my head. I thought everybody was like that. I didn't know it was just me or just a certain people. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, for sure, I've always even words uh, can have colors. Anything I think of can have a color. Uh, it's it just associates. I don't know. It's like it. it I, th I think because of that, I'm really good at painting and really good at like designing colors because i'm really uh for example stage all our stages everything i've 
from day one. I, from the first show, I had a lighting list. I had a list for every song. I was like, the, at the Roxy, they were like, what the fuck is this, bro? I was like, I'm, I went to the light guy. It's our first show ever. We have 20 minutes, <laughs> five, four, five songs. I have a list going, okay, the intros are red. Uh, then you the chorus comes in and then you put in blue and then the strobe this section. The guy's like, I can't follow this. I got 10 other bands. I'm like, dude, we're not 10 bands. We're one band. Do it. Does anybody else have a list? No. Okay, then follow my list, bro. You can only have to do one list. Do the rest. So I got it that way. And um, it was until the last show where I do all the stage production with our production manager. Like Now we have people we hire to do stuff. But I still am there, standing there. I go early on tour. I leave a week early, any tour we do. And I sit there and I sit. I go and we have a rehearsal, like dress rehearsal with the crew where I make sure we go through the, the set and I make sure the lighting is on point. So when I, and then when I'm on stage, it's even different for me because I'm sure the rest of the band just plays not knowing what's happening and they, they just trust it's going to be good because it's always been good. Um, but me, I'm like, I'm like watching as I'm playing. I have to also see, whoa, that shit, he missed the cue. <laughs> like, and then I got to talk to the light guy afterwards. Yo, that part of bounce, you missed the clue. <laughs> you missed the cue. There was yeah. like a part where you had to put a black out and then the strobe, not strobe, then the blackout. Then, you know what I mean? It's just, I'm still anal like that when it comes to uh, colors and lights and uh, editing. And I do all the video editing and I, you know what I mean? It's just something that is, is install, instilled in me. Um, and I'm guessing it's from that. Who knows? You know, man, that's see, that's fascinating to me when people can do that. Cause I'm not that way, but I've seen it. Mm -hmm. So do you know who Daryl Hammond is from Saturday Night Live? Yeah, of course. The okay. guy that used to do Trump. Yes. And, yeah. and, and, and every, or Bill Clinton and every, like he Bill did Clinton, Bill Clinton yeah, yeah. with Bill Clinton at the, I've at met the, him. I've met him dude. at the one. Cause we, we did SNL one day, uh, once. And I remember he was watching the whole time. And uh, I met him at the party afterwards. He was a really good guy, a really cool guy. He told me he was a fan, so that was really cool. Yeah. Okay, so this is good because so he he does he's famous for all his voices, right? He yes, just yes, released yes. like his. It's an extremely traumatic doc, uh, book of his child. It's it's fucked up the things his mom oh, did wow. to him. Like, uh, oh my god, it's, it, it'll blow you. It'll make your skin melt. But he came out of it right with something somewhat positive, but it still troubles him. But at the same time. Every voice that he did, he assigned a color. So it like Popeye was blue and like uh, Bill Clinton was gray or whatever, you know, like everything had a color. But when so they, he's a singer, dude. I feel him. I yes, do that too. But when yeah, the yeah. one color he didn't ever say with his therapist was red. And red was a color that never attributed to a voice because one, one, when he was with his mother in the kitchen one morning, uh, the red was the color of the flowers on the tree outside the kitchen window when she, she was like, uh, I don't know. I don't remember if she was bipolar or something. I don't want to get it wrong, but she basically would make him do fucked up things and like hurt Ooh. him and stuff like slam his fingers in doors and things like that. She actually had him stick his tongue out and then stuck a knife through it. And when <gasps> she did that, he was looking out the window and saw those red flowers and from that point on, red was not a part of oh anything he could go to. He would get physically sick if he thought of something that that like the color red came into him that way. Anyways, oh I don't want to. I don't want to do it shocking, the justice of fucking shocking. it up. But you need to look at this. Like you need to either read or or get the audio book or what. There's, I might a, have to. there's a documentary on Netflix. I think it's on Netflix. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it's it's Daryl Hammond's basically going through writing the book and his life. I might have seen that. Uh, just scrolling through yeah. titles. It's wow. brutal. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm also a Netflix whore, you know? Dude, <laughs> hey, you need to watch it because you will identify with the colors. And that's what, man, what not sparked to. it yeah. in my mind when you said that. Wow. I was like, man. Wow. That, and, it, it gave me chills, bro, what you dude, just said. It's giving me chills again after watching. Like, yeah. Oh, my God. But so yeah, bro. that's insane. You guys have that connection. But anyways, that's that stuff fascinates me, like how the mind works, like how we we stereotype people as a form of like uh, organization in our brain because we can only store yeah, a certain it, amount of people. Right. So we have just folders. You, bro, it tells you how deep your brain is, bro. Oh you usually God. find this shit out when you do a hallucinogenic. But, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, that's when you like go, whoa, dude, that brain is crazy. Um but like, yeah, bro, you know, when you learn to like use it the way we're using it and like it actually, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Actually like recognize the fact that you, you see it that way, yeah. then you can analyze it and kind of great, get greatness out of it, you know, and like have it be a good thing, you know, have it be positive. Exactly, man. So tell me this. So 
are are your are your parents still around? Yes, God willing. Thank oh, you. Oh man, so they've yeah. seen your success. They've seen you take your drive and what they taught you and turn it into something worldwide, massive success. That's yes. that's so awesome that they they've been able bro, to yeah. see that. Um, how do they Man. how do they react to that? Like, I mean, you're just shot. and the other thing I wanted to ask too is is your last name Odajian? Uh, yes. It, hopefully, I pronounced that right. Um, you did. It's, yeah. Is that I've never seen a last name even close to that. Is that your family? Is that your family name? It's my family name, but of course, after the genocide that was given to my family okay. uh, by Turkey. That's what I was curious. So my about. my my great grandparents and one or two of my parents, my grandparents, I think were like babies. Uh, they escaped it. And because they survived it, the genocide, the uh, genocide of 1915, the Armenian genocide perpetrated by the Otto Ottoman empire, the Turks back uh -huh. then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's I me mean, not think, I know that's why I'm around. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Odajian uh, is not a uh, long, uh, like old, old school Armenian last name or anything. It's actually part Turkish. They, the people that I think, I think when my grandpa, my great grandparents, the way they would do it is because we were orphans. They were orphaned. A lot of them were orphaned and they didn't know what the fuck right so they had to give them names, right? So I guess the people that took over or the parents that took over my great grand whoever was like raised them uh -huh. must have so Odaji, I guess, is a is a, a Turkish word for like um um not housekeeper, but like Let's say someone that owns a hostel, like someone, a caretaker. Oh, a caretaker or a caregiver. Caretaker, or, um, it's, yeah, something like that. Owner of a hostel, something like so. Hospitality. Um, they, or... Hospitality. So they gave that, my great grandpa, great grandfather, that name and said, okay, you're this now. And he just went on his life, not being that. So I don't really wow. know what my original name would have been. I don't know. I have no clue, but I know that because I don't know any other Odajans. There's a lot of Armenian last names that people share. There's like Sultanian and there's like. Oh, 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 Onesian. There's a lot of names. Gregorian. There's a lot of Armenian names that people share. This one, I've never heard anyone else have. Odajian. You know, uh, it's just it is what it is, man. I've gone yeah. gone by it my whole. Life. That's but I know the history is it's pretty bad, bro. The, yeah. Our history with the genocide is pretty bad. You know, until today, shit's going crazy out there uh, with Azerbaijan claiming things, land that we were originally Armenia and Turkey still really bullying our little country. Um, you know, for a hundred years, they've been saying they didn't perpetrate the genocide, that it was just casualties of the war. Now, what war? We, there was no war in, in our area, one. Yeah. Two, we didn't even have any, uh, we didn't have an army. We were pretty much sitting ducks. They came and took us over, killed all the men, all the wise men, all the elders, all the politicians, all the architects, the doctors, they got rid of them first to so get rid of all the smart and the people that could make change. Then they m led the women and children and old people on a march saying, we're saving you from this people. And then as they were marching, they raped and fucking pillaged these people. I mean, it's evil shit. Man. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, now they today say that never happened. And there's a lot of Turks out there, young ones that believe that it never happened. And they think that we're this country that claims this shit against theirs and we're bad. So it's what they've taught their kids. You know what I mean? It's like North um, Korea shit. Yeah, for sure. Bro. And so, and then crazy enough that this year, a month ago, the president of Turkey goes out and says, we got to continue what our ancestors started. They want to be... Yeah. Okay. So there's the cocksucker in one breath saying it never happened. And in another breath saying they got to continue what happened. Yeah. So how do you, and, but America, we're still allies with Turkey. <laughs> we still give them billions of dollars for fucking arms and bases and shit that we have there. We, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, we, so it's a fucked up country, uh, world, bro. <laughs> it's it really so fucked is. Up. <laughs> I don't even know how to sum it up besides saying it's just fucked up because I mean, yeah. how do you deny something and then say that we got to finish it at a day in the twenty first century bro like come on bro like yeah. you don't that's like barbaric shit bro like we're gonna kill your race off because you're in our way <laughs> that's what they're saying yeah isn't it amazing exactly that shit like this can saying. still happen with the internet in existence like it is crazy. it is bro they're doing it now on the oh border and america's talking about the pandemic still they're not talking about anything else around the world they're talking about only like that shit that went down in beirut we're not hearing about it no more uh-huh do we be, and I don't want to go talk about that because it's too too deep. But there's some really 
bad stuff that is true about that that it's not it didn't it was not an accident that shit was was not an accident and i know this because i you know people that are there and but it's a cover-up uh both sides don't want to talk about how it went down both sides you know yeah uh it is what it is man i don't want to get too deep in negative shit but you know i i understand it is what it is yeah Yeah. this is where this is what the the and not in this instance but the fun of the show is is it just goes where it goes right like yeah yeah. hopefully 90 percent of the stuff you haven't said a thousand times on every fucking interview and podcast you've done you know i haven't we're getting pretty deep on this one i like it i I like it and one thing too like coming up with the age of the internet you guys with system were able to make your way kind of as the internet was coming along before when people were still buying records right like you could still make some money when you're re- when your records sold right oh, yeah. like and and so oh, yeah. you guys were lucky on that end too to be able to to basically make a, a a very good living i would assume from from the success of the band that would then carry you on through these days you know with the other things yeah. you want to do um uh, but still having that draw after making you know, making uh, what's the word? Making your nut, I guess they call it. Like uh, your nest egg, right? Like your your yeah. su- success with the band, financially stable, from being you know having to hand to mouth it for so many years. Of course, the way just watching, you know, how much grace you guys uh, continue to have through that success because you guys, I mean, you didn't you didn't come from money, you didn't come from so you no, appreciate no, what you have. Of- yeah, and no, uh, not one member. People. Yeah, not one member came from a rich family. Yeah, not one of us. It was we were all just driven. You know, I mean, your first we're, fucking show was pay to play. Like, which yeah. is <laughs> Jesus Christ. We what paid, would what would kids pay nowadays to go back there and be at that show? Oh right? my god, Fuck. bro! I remember I uh, they gave us seventy five tickets, and we sold like a hundred forty nine of them or something. Like we had to go back and get another seventy five. You know, like yes. Yeah, bro. And the guy was like, really? Like, you now you're going to do my light before. diagram, fucker. Yeah, yeah. Fucker, I can't <laughs> believe you. Uh, really? Like, where did you come from? We didn't even have a demo tape. The dude, the dude took a took a chance on us. I remember his name, Brian Markovich. That was his name. Oh, man. Um, Hopefully he's still around, kicking himself. Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't heard of him. But yeah, dude, he gave us our first shot, bro. He was like, do it. Like, show me. Can you sell 75 tickets? I was like, brah. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it go. on. <laughs> and I was in college. I was in Glendale College passing tickets out, selling tickets. My family bought tickets. My friends, all my friends' friends, everyone that, you know, they knew we were this band that was, like, kind of working at a studio for a year or whatever. We were a year or two, and, you know, we just – it was what it was, man. It was fucking great times, man. Great times to, yeah. to look back at you know i kind of wish we were still going you know i know i have a new project and stuff but like there's some history bro like some, some love i really love our system i really love being uh with my guys you know as much as drama has gone on and what else has happened it doesn't matter i still remember the good times and i always say you know that it can always this is part of my optimism you know people laugh at me and go oh man get over it i'm not getting over it bro it's not about getting over it. it's not like oh i wish no it's not that it's I think, you know, I hope it's not an I wish it's an I hope because it was fun when it di- when it was happening. I don't think things can just end like that. No one's knock on wood. No one's dead. Um, no one's um, no one. Cuss- no one's done anything to each other's family. No- nothing horrible has been done by any member to the other. Sure. It's mostly just differences in ideas, differences in where you want to go in life. And that's where we're at. And yeah. which is I think natural. All that- it's natural, bro. It's natural. Marriages break up and you're not going to say, oh, you know, it's you know, what it is, what it is, bro. I, I've talked about that before. I'm just saying. Yeah. The reason why I have a, I'm optimistic is because no one's really, it's like, that, it's not like someone's banged someone's mom. It's not like something crazy has happened. Yeah. It's not like someone's done something really horribly wrong to the other person. It's just kind of, it is what it is, man. Sure. And that's why I'm optimistic. One day, maybe everyone looks at each other and goes, bro, let's just do this and does it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm not going to yeah. cry over it. I, it's not going to change my life any other way. It, I, but it was. it's something I'd like to happen. It's one of those things. I mean, I'm going to make a wish and see if I can make it happen, you know? Yeah. But uh, until then, I'm going to do what I do, bro. You know? I'm, yeah. You know, You've I'm lived that. Me. You've lived that. You've been there. You've lived that. It's still there. But at the same time. The coolest thing about with System is just how original the band was. Like no one sounded like System, and they still and and it it you guys like came into a genre, but you and you changed it, but no one really ripped off 
system that I can tell, like no one could pull it off, right? Like, so you guys remained. Yeah. It, it was funny. <laughs> you guys have one of the best managers. Like the, the Velvet <laughs> Hammer is unreal. Like Taylor, yeah, over, I love Taylor over it, but shout out to Taylor. And, oh, she's the best. She's I'm, the best. And I'm, look, I'm lucky to have them backing North Kingsley now. Yeah. You know, they're backing North that. Kingsley That's with, awesome. the same passion, with the same passion. They see something in North Kingsley that is the same, which is, it's different. It's, um, I, we've created a sound that's different. Yeah, it's way different than system, of course, but it's still different from everything else that's going on right now. Dude, it is. Uh, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. You. you put out those three songs. So, so, uh, yeah. "Die for the Pick" is my favorite. Uh, the 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 fucking groove on that. The the even the little stuff like the little echoes on the guitar. Like I'm picking yeah. up on all this shit, and I'm just like I'm Thank loving you. it. Right? Like I'm hearing that. Like the there's that vibe that that unique vibe that you just can't put your finger on right like you can because you're creating it but I, yeah man like it's, I, it's I, you there's something in common i'm you know something in common i think is that every song is different but still fits the dna of the band yeah. like for the first album for example right we had a song like sweet pea mashed up with a song like spiders mashed up with a song like people yeah. three different fucking songs that you would never think the same band would make but we did and it made an album and it was accepted right well it's the same here we have a song like like that which is different than die for the pick which is different than shotguns that's the first three uh -huh. we have the next three coming is completely world different it's like we have a song called oh, i don't want to talk about it. there's a rifle and thought was gonna be the main single that is out of control, I think. I think I can't wait for people to hear it because it's got elements that no one else has. I know that. I yeah. know no one's got this. I've never heard it. If there is, bring it out. I want to see you know, where it came from. But there's stuff happening in there that I haven't heard. I don't know how we came out with it. We just kind of did it, and it sounded great, so we kept it. And I come from that school of, like, if it doesn't sound like anyone else and it st sounds good, print it, you know? Yeah. Let's go with it. I'm not going to join. I'm not going to write a coattail. I'm going to... I'm going to create the coattail <laughs> for people to write on. <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean? I feel like that's what's going on and that's what m might happen. But the whole staggered release is also an idea I had. I was like, you know, it's an ADD generation. Uh, people have iPhones, bro. Uh, you could do 30 things in one minute. You know, you can change your mind and like, okay, I'm going to play a game. No, I'm going to check my email. No, I'm going to check Instagram. No, I'm going to go edit a video. No, I'm going to go talk to someone. I'm going to go call someone. I'm going to go video chat. with. There's like 50 things you can do in two minutes. That makes your brain kind of hard to focus, you know, when you want to focus on something. Yeah, yeah. So I thought giving a new band like us, giving 12 songs at once, a lot of songs would get, would fall under the, you know, um, like two, three songs would get focused and then 10, nine songs would go under the rug, you know? And yeah. then, uh, so I thought maybe we give every song the time it deserves by splitting it up, release it in a full year, two three months four months whatever it takes i don't have a release dates for them i'm thinking about volume two because volume one's out now and i love the response i feel like i'd like to give the world a bigger catalog of music so i'm already right now we're in talks of the videos and i want to drop it within the next month month and a half volume two awesome. i'm not gonna wait yeah i'm gonna just drop it before the end of the year kill it take some time kick a couple of months off beginning of the year drop volume three you know what i mean yeah and because we got so much music bro we're like we're in there working man we're like we it's not even work we get in there it's like we have we know what we do best right and that's yeah. the beauty of kingsley with three of us three of us we each do something the other doesn't and we're happy doing that it's not like we each want to do what other one does no i'm the i do what i do boom everyone loves that and gives me that space which is god sent you know it's so liberating i know what sorrow does sorrow is amazing beat maker amazing guy a on the board, so I give it to him. He's sitting at my throne doing what I used to do for like a chosen, but he's doing it. Why do everything? Why would I do that to myself? A, a good leader finds a great team and respects the team and gives the team members the opportunity to shine. So that's what I'm doing, bro. I have a vocalist like Ray. That dude's words and lyrics, bro. Oh, I come from the yeah. world. I come from the world of Wu Tang Clan. My uh -huh. one of my best friends in the world is the RZA from Wu Tang. Yeah. I mean, I come from that. This yes. guy fits in that mold, bro. I swear. Like I'm I'm intrigued by his vocals. I love it. I mean, I'm I feel lucky for finding his ass. <laughs> I, <laughs> like agree. Being, I agree with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Having him represent me, you know, because in the long run, he's representing my words, you know, he's representing my thoughts. You know, and uh, vice versa. So yeah. 
Yeah, man. We get in there. Like we have a, we have a, we have a session tonight. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. It's the first session since we dropped on Friday, you know? Yeah. Uh, Dude, this so. there's so many through lines here. I could I could there I mean so many through lines here. I mean you you're and what you said about leadership too like uh, a good leader, you know, helps people, you know, become who they're supposed to be and to surpass them, right? The same thing your dad did with you. Like he yeah. he built you up to surpass him, right? To to be more successful, to go farther, to you know, he gave you the tools to find out who you were and push it beyond, right? The same thing you're doing for yes. your kids, the same thing you're doing with music, right? Like it's, it's, you're pushing boundaries, but you're also helping other people discover who they are to eventually probably surpass, right? And that's I want the goal. Them, bro. I, they're younger, they're in early thirties. Yeah. I kind of want them, bro. In the beginning, I was just gonna sign them to a production deal and be like, yo, let me help you guys make something of yourselves. And then we kind of did something together. I was like, fuck, let's make it this do together. So I want them to shine. I don't know how long I'm going to, I mean, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, what if one day I'm like, go do a solo project guys, like go kill it. You know yeah. what I mean? Go fuck, take what I take, what you learned from this experience with me and go do something, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And I'm not going to be hard up. I mean, I'm not going to be like, Oh, what the fuck you're doing? No, bro, go run, please. It, it's a pleasure for me to sit back and watch something that we help blossom bloom you know what i mean absolutely absolutely yeah. and it has such an amazing backstory and like everything we talked about today like the, we've gone to so many different places but the through line is there right like the 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 through line of passion and leadership and i you know originality and and perseverance and just positivity right like I'm, in, positive, I'm inspired right like, now, Shavo. Like I'm no, literally yeah, like inspired to ready to just go fuck with the rest of my day, right? Like I, Dude. I am so glad we had this conversation. And, and Me I mean, too, bro. we just put in our hour, man. And I don't want to keep you Me any too. longer. But no, I appreciate you. We can you you can come back on anytime, bro. And and let me know, we'll bro. Connect We're, eventually, and and uh, maybe we connect for volume two, and we talk about it after volume two. Is that we can have another yeah. quick, quick chat? Doesn't need to be a full hour. Dude, talk we can about do two hours. Bit. I'm loving yeah, this. Yeah, we can. This, this is what we do. Two hours. <laughs> I yeah, know, man. but I I committed right. to an hour to Charlie, and I, I liked it. I like. I knew you have a lot going on. I really like to respect people's time because time is. Is Thank the you. most valuable thing to me. If it goes three hours, sure, but I I definitely like to respect that time and and uh, Thank you, dude, we nailed it. I I really this was an awesome awesome chat, dude. And and uh, you know I always sum it up, but like uh, you know you're one of my musical heroes. You're one of the 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 people that really pushed the boundaries for me early on. And uh, it's you. just a pleasure to, oh to spend an hour with you, you know, like shit. pleasure is mine, brother. The pleasure is mine, brother. Dude, thank you honestly, so much. Honestly. And and uh, enjoy your you. session and uh, yeah. keep pumping out the good shit, man. Keep fighting the we good will, fight. Bro, we will. Let us, know how you, let us know how you feel about everything, man. I really love uh, to hear back from people, other artists on things I do, you know, because I always take it and run with it, you know, so. Looking forward to hearing some more uh, reviews out there, see what's going on. And I appreciate the time, brother. I really Dude, do. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, buddy. We'll talk soon. Be well, bro. Be right. well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Shavo Odajian from System of a Down and North Kingsley. Go check out North Kingsley on Spotify, Apple Music, anywhere you find this. He's got some badass music videos going up on YouTube as well. So if you go check out their YouTube channel, it's going to it's gonna be uh, North Kingsley. Uh, the song I played in this uh, episode is called Die for the Pick. It's my favorite song they've put out so far. But the whole project is awesome. Every song's different. Different instrumentation. Uh, th this dude that's uh, – their um, – their vocalist is just a wordsmith, like like Sage Francis, good. And uh, so, I mean, he just, Chavo seems to surround himself with great people. He's very, as you heard, is very inviting and very um, charismatic, but also driven and knows what he has and knows what he's good at and attacks it that way. And it's, it's so awesome to see that. Um, and to be a fan of his for so long and getting to spend an hour on the phone uh, with with Shavo is awesome. So thank you so much, guys, for coming back week after week. Hit the hit the PeerPleasurePodcast dot com uh, for your merchandise for that shirt. It's going to be badass. It's coming out this month. You can pre order it now. Uh, we've got an amazing episode next week as well. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. It's really hits home to where I come from. And yeah, I'm not going to say more than that because it's going to be awesome. You guys are going to see it when it drops. 
But thank you so much for listening to this episode. Thank you for downloading the Chino Moreno episode. We have so much cool shit in the pile that is done already. If something happens tomorrow, all this shit's going to come out anyway. But if it stopped today, we have so much cool shit. You're going to be set up till fucking December. So uh, I am so fired up. I, I am just going 100 miles an hour. But this whole thing has been amazing. And thank you so much to the Equal Vision family and the Sound Talent Media family and all of you guys. You guys are family as well. All right, guys, I'm going to get out of here. I've got a ton of shit to do. And like I say, the air quality is awful and my voice is torn to shit. So as always, guys, we'll see you on the radio.